talk about whatever I want to talk about. They said, pick a, pick a topic um, and go for it. And um, I specifically t take care of a lot of patients with gastrointestinal cancers um, and colon and rectal cancer being one of the most common types of cancer, I felt like um, was a good topic um, to go into some detail on seeing as I think a lot of people will have personal um, experiences in terms of family members or friends um, who've had colon cancer. Do you all see my um, mouse um, cursor, mm -hmm. by the way? Or is that only visible on mine? No, we can see it. Perfect, good. Because I sometimes point things out on my slides. Okay. So um, to start out with just as like a background in terms of cancer in the United States, um, this is older data from 2007, but I like the way that this is graphically um, laid out, looking at different types of cancer um, in women in blue and men in the red, okay? And the lighter color is how many new cases are diagnosed. Um, and the darker color is the number of deaths attributed to that type of cancer in a given year. Um, and as you can see, when you take men and women together, colorectal cancer is usually right around second place in terms of number of deaths um, in a given year. Also though, a lot of cases that are diagnosed and cured um, in, in the diseases that are you know, harder to treat, we'll usually see the, the number of new cases and the number of deaths almost overlap like in pancreatic cancer. But in some of our cancers like prostate cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, increasingly lung cancer, um, that have more effective treatments, you know, um, we are catching some of these earlier, providing treatments that help people live longer or potentially curing them. And um, we are improving outcomes there, but this is a, a, a fairly common um, type of cancer. Sorry, my toddler just got home. So you may hear screaming in the background as he looks for me. I'm, I'm hidden up in my bedroom instead of my office for that reason. Um, anatomically, just to look at what we're talking about with the colon. Imagine you're looking at someone's body. So this side of the picture is actually the right side of the body. Um, and this side is the left side. And um, the colon, the, the small intestines are where your food is digested. And then it kind of connects up here to the colon at the cecum. The, uh, then the ascending colon is on the right side of the body. This part, the hepatic flexure is anchored to your liver, which sits right here runs across the body, attaches to the spleen here, the descending left side of the colon, um, transitions to the sigmoid colon and the rectum. And then that connects to the anus and the sphincter there, and that's where the poop comes out of the bottom, okay? And, and the colon's main job, all of the digestion and, and getting the nutrition out of your food happens in the small intestines. The colon's main um, job is to extract the water out of the, um, you know, digestive tract and kind of form more solid stools. So this is just kind of a, um, this, this is basically showing an outline of the, of the mutations. Okay, sorry, um, this, is, this is the child. Uh, I'm gonna have him go away. Okay, Nathan, can I give a lecture? Can you go eat dinner with mommy, please? Oh. Can you say, yeah, okay. you try bye, bye. Can you say bye bye, Daddy? Bye bye. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. No, just bye bye. Okay, yeah, you can go potty with mommy. No, I don't want to go potty. Okay, bye bye. <laughs> Sorry, very sad. That's great. Timing, I apologize. <laughs> um, so, yeah, is there a lot? Oh. Hold on, give me one second. No problem. Uh, Apologize for the interruption. So um, in terms of how colon cancer develops, um, there's kind of a theory in terms of cancer development in general, where it's multiple hits of mutations in normal cells. So in other words, throughout our body at all times, um, there is cell turnover, new cells um, being, being essentially copied to replace ones that are dying. You can think of it like if you um, bite your cheek, and have a little cut, the, the cells repair themselves. There's a repair going on throughout the body all the time. Um, the cells are dividing billions of times throughout your lifetime. And all of the DNA in those cells is being replicated 
each time your cell is dividing? Well, um, occasionally there are essentially um, errors in transcription. You can think of it like a typo. Like if I'm retyping um, an essay, it will occasionally um, have a typo or a mutation. And sometimes those mutations can lead to the cells dividing more rapidly or growing um, into an abnormal collection of cells like a tumor. And so essentially this is an example of a, a, of a potential cascade of mutations um, that could occur first starting to have an abnormal collection of cells, then developing into an adenoma, which um, is, is a polyp essentially that's not cancerous. Um, you could think of that like a mole on your skin. There could be like a mole on the inside of the colon tract, okay? And then if that develops more mutations, it can eventually turn into a carcinoma, which is an invasive cancer. You can see it invading into the wall of the colon there. And then eventually that invasion can go through the bloodstream or the lymphatic system um, to produce metastasis where the cancer spreads to other parts of the body. And the general rule in cancer is that when cancer kills, it's because it metastasizes to multiple parts of the body. A cancer that's in only one area um, tends not to be you know, fatal. It's when cancer spreads and overwhelms the system that um, it becomes more of a health threat. So what are some risk factors for development of colon and rectal cancer? By far, the biggest one is age, and that's the case for most types of cancer. Um, the longer you live, if you think about it, the more chances your cells have to divide and pick up new mutations. And so basically, the longer any of us lives, the more likely um, that that some error will come about and, and create a tumor. But there are other things um, that can influence that risk. Certainly, um, family history influences things, potentially genetics. Um, some people may inherit a mutation already in place. For example, if you inherit this APC mutation from the slide before, well, that's one less mutation you need to pick up during your lifetime to eventually go down the cascade um, towards cancer. Um, IBD stands for inflammatory bowel disease, but in general, the general rule is any inflammatory condition um, in a part of the body will lead to more um, likely for you to obtain mutations and more likely to develop cancer. So folks that have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis um, are at especially high risk for colon cancer and have special screening guidelines. There is definitely thought that different dietary choices can affect um, risk of colon cancer, it's really, really, really hard to study the effect of nutrition because it's not like we can do an experiment where we raise someone in a box and only feed them certain amounts of food for 50 years um, or only certain types of food. And so we go off of people's reports. Well, you know, if you ask me, what have I eaten over the last week? I could probably tell you what I ate for lunch this morning. Um, Might've had a pizza of some of my kids, um, Pop-Tart for breakfast, but you know, you're relying on, on somebody's report and, and, and it's, hard to, it's hard to tease out what are the causative links. So if I, you often see clickbait articles online that'll say like, oh, um, you know, I'm sure everybody's seen, oh, if you drink a glass of red wine a day, that's good for your heart health. Well, um, there may be other, other variables that we're not catching with that in terms of what kind of people drink a glass of red wine every day. Or if you said eating a salad once a week um, decreases your risk of cancer. Well, um, where does that person live? Uh, what access, are they in a food desert? What access to you know, fresh vegetables do they have in their grocery stores? Do, do they have enough money to afford eating those types of foods? Are people that eat salad less likely to smoke cigarettes um, or have other health problems? So. Um, it's very hard to isolate out the diet. I get that question a lot. Well, what can I eat? Well, there are theories that maybe a low fiber diet or high fat diet. Um, some theories animal like red meat um, may increase the risk. I tend not to put um, too much, I, I tend not to put too much credence into any specific recommendations because it's not really high quality evidence compared to um, how we decide to do treatments because you can't really design an experiment for this. One thing that's very clear is higher weight and obesity 
um, is associated with increased risk of colorectal cancer. So the main thing I tell people is general balance in all things. Don't go crazy on any one type of food. Try not to overeat and stay at a healthy weight. And I think that that is um, more than enough. Of course, like with many types of cancer, smoking and excessive alcohol use are associated with colorectal cancer. A more sedentary lifestyle, less exercise is associated with increased risk. Um, so, you know, a lot of these things aren't rocket science. It's generally saying healthier, you know, these bottom four are saying healthier lifestyle tends to be, um, show decreased risk, but there are some factors that you can't control like your genetics and family history. Um, this is just looking at the number of cases diagnosed at a given age in both men and women. It tends to be a little bit more common to see in men. Um, and as you can see, it's as you age, the risk is increasing and, and the risk really starts to pick up more in the 40s to 50s. Um, and the risk really does go up the longer you age. The reason you see these drop-offs in the number of cases diagnosed at the older ages is if you think about it, um, the screening recommendations go to age 75. So you reach a certain age and the thought is, well, catching these polyps or these precancers isn't gonna be so helpful for you um, or, or finding a, a very early stage colon cancer. If that was gonna you know, cause you health problems 10 years down the line, well, when you reach age 90, um, you may not have 10 years down the line because of other reasons. And so it makes less sense to do intensive testing for different types of cancer um, as people get into the much older um, timeframe. Um, so this is just kind of a pie chart that looks at um, family, you know, like how often is colon cancer really hereditary? Most, the, the majority of cases of colon cancer are sporadic, meaning there's no family history and it kind of just hits you out of the blue with no family history. Um, there's somewhere between 10 and 30% where there is some family history, but if you do a genetic screening, there's no specific um, condition associated with it. In other words, um, you know, similar to some families have high, ri high rates of diabetes in like siblings or parents and children, but there's no specific gene or syndrome related to that. It just, um, there's a little bit higher risk in the family. And then there are these other less common scenarios where there are these syndromes that run through families um, that are passed directly on like Lynch syndrome, um, familial adenomatous polyposis, which are associated with colon cancer and other types of cancer. So Lynch syndrome is associated with uterine cancer and stomach cancer. Um, and these are the minority of cases. So for in most cases, when a patient comes in with um, colorectal cancer to see me, um, unless they're very young, um, generally they don't need to be, or if they have a strong family history, generally they don't need genetic testing because the, the vast majority of the time, um, these are non-genetic syndromes. This is just a slide I think is interesting to kind of show that there are clear um, differences across the world in how different can how often different cancers are seen, um, and it it shows there must be some sort of lifestyle factors or or genetic factors or both at play, and we know that it's both. Um, but as an example, you know the American diet actually is pretty protective of stomach cancer. So if you are in East Asia. Um, the rates of gastric stomach cancer are much higher than in the United States. Um, our diet and lifestyle, though, uh, leads to higher risk of colon cancer. So it's like pick your poison. And we know that it's somewhat related to lifestyle because there was a very interesting study um, that was done over the course of the 20th century where immigrants from Japan, essentially, to California, they looked at the rates of colon cancer and gastric cancer in you know, the immigrants in the first generation, their children, and then the second generation, the grandchildren. And the risk of stomach cancer was highest in the folks that immigrated when they were adults. The first generation had about half way in between the risk. And by the time you get to the second generation, um, the risk of the stomach cancer was lower, more similar um, you know, to non-immigrant populations, which indicates something about diet and lifestyle in the United States is leading to different types of cancer than in Japan because it shouldn't be genetic 
um, if, if we're talking about um, immigrants and their children. So I, I, I find that to be interesting to, that it shows there's something, um, but you can't necessarily pinpoint one specific type of food or anything like that. Here is some data that I think is useful in terms of um, looking at at-risk populations. I think it's important to point out um, that we have big healthcare disparities in general um, across different populations in the US. It's, it's very relevant um, to my practice, you know, mostly on the South and Southwest sides. Um, as it turns out, our black patients are at a little bit higher risk in general of um, getting colon cancer. The, but, the, but there's an even bigger gap not just in number of diagnoses on the top, there's a bigger gap in terms of mortality. And, you know, I think there's so many factors that could be at play here. Um, clearly, there are disparities in who has access um, to healthcare, to getting screened and getting these caught at an earlier stage. And I, and I think that's a major factor. Um, and part of the reason I have this graph on the right is if you look at early stage colon cancer, this local colon cancer, these are basically the cure rates, the five-year survival rates. It doesn't matter if you're white, black, Asian, Hispanic. If you are diagnosed at this local stage of colon cancer, the cure rates are essentially 90%. It's not like, um, you know, it's not like these numbers are very different. We're, we're curing everybody equally. Um, and, and that indicates to me that the differences here in terms of mortality are potentially related to, you know, lack of diagnosis at an earlier stage. So if it, so if we're only finding your cancer once it's more advanced, it makes sense that our outcomes aren't going to be as good, no matter how well we try to treat it. It's kind of like the cat's out of the bag. So I think this screening prevention, um, catching things early, getting that access out to everybody, education is really important um, because our outcomes can be quite good for everybody. If we, um, if we catch it early. So in terms of signs and symptoms of colon cancer, I think the most important thing to outline, the most common scenario of someone who comes to see me with a newly diagnosed colon cancer is that they had no symptoms at all. I think this is like a really important thing to, for people to understand in terms of what it means to screen for cancer. By definition, when we are screening for cancer, for example, doing a mammogram for um, screening for best breast cancer or a pap smear or a colonoscopy. When we're talking about screening, it means you have no symptoms. We're looking for something that's so early you don't see it. If you, um, you know, a, a mammogram is trying to catch a breast cancer before you feel a lump there. We're trying to find colon cancers that are small enough that they wouldn't have caused any symptom for you at all. So um, I think it's important to realize that very early cancers may not cause any symptom that's noticeable to you at all. Now, other scenarios that I see that lead to um, somebody getting a colonoscopy, if you are diagnosed with iron deficiency anemia, okay, that is low blood counts um, and low iron. Essentially, your body is using up its iron stores trying to replace the blood you're losing. Um, the most common scenario I see for why someone has iron deficiency is actually heavy periods. But another reason that it can happen is if you're losing some blood in the colon or in the bowels, and that can be from a tumor that's kind of oozing blood. So anybody that has iron deficiency anemia with no other sources of bleeding is recommended to get a colonoscopy um, and potentially an upper endoscopy to look at the esophagus and the stomach. Um, of course, that means that blood in the stool, um, you know, there's subtle differences in terms of if it's something where you're only getting it when you wipe, you know, that can be more hemorrhoids or an anal fissure. Um, but any, in general, if there's blood in the stool, you wanna let your um, physician know about it to kind of do an assessment of um, whether that's coming from higher up. Obviously the most common scenario of blood in the stool is not cancer, but it's worth um, looking into. Changes in bowel habits. So if you're somebody who was always once a day, but now um, consistently more constipated, you'll hear people say like their stool becomes more ribbony or thinner um, with the thought that there's a mass kind of blocking part of the colon. And so, um, you know, as the stool comes in, it has to get thinner to make it past that area. Um, 
abdominal pain and bloating, very nonspecific symptom. Obviously, I don't, you know, I hesitate to put these type of symptoms because a lot of people, including me, get abdominal pain and bloating once in a while. I, I think it's misguided to immediately like, oh my gosh, I must have cancer. But if it's something progressive um, and consistent over a long period of time, it's certainly worth um, speaking to your doctor about. A big one for cancer in general is unintentional weight loss. As physicians, especially with overweight patients, we want you know people to reach a healthier weight. But I tell people I'm, I'm secretly relieved when patients have trouble losing weight um, as an oncologist. I want you to have to fight and scratch and claw and, and diet and exercise really heavily to lose the weight. If you're, if you're just saying, you know, I have no appetite anymore and I just lost 20 pounds um, out of the blue without trying, that sets up red flags for any doctor, okay? Um, new unexplained fatigue. Again, fatigue is basically present in everybody. Um, I'm a busy physician with the toddler that you saw break in earlier. We all have fatigue. Um, but something that's new and different for you and progressive over long term is something worth talking about. So in general, I kind of touched on this before, but in terms of principles of cancer screening across all types of cancer, okay, this is te testing of people that have no symptoms. And the goal of it is to identify cancer at an earlier stage when you're hoping you're going to be able to cure it. So the important things for cancer to have an effective screening test is the cancer has to be common enough that you're gonna find it a decent amount of the time with limiting the false positives. So in other words, every test has a possible false positive, you know, um, on CT scan, you know, on any scan that we do, they can find little spots that may not be anything and, it, and it's, you know, not a true cancer. Um, and so you wanna limit causing damage of extra tests, anxiety, misdiagnosis, um, while also, catching enough true cancers, okay? Um, another big um, thing that's important is to have a window of opportunity to be able to treat the cancer. So you can imagine if there were a type of cancer that no matter how early you diagnose it, you can't cure it and there's no effective treatment, then there's not really, in a sense, there's no real point in screening for it because catching it earlier doesn't let you to improve the outcome. Okay, in colon cancer, like we talked about before, at an early stage, um, we have very high rates of cure. Um, and so we have that window of opportunity to um, effectively treat the cancer if we catch it earlier. You need to have a safe, accurate, cost effective test. Um, so if the only test to do um, to catch a cancer is a major surgery or something, you know, where you literally open up someone's belly and look for it. Well, that's not an effective screening test because we wouldn't tell every person on planet earth to get a major surgery. Um, and so it's a trade-off, you know, for certain types of cancer, like prostate cancer, it's a blood test um, that can be used in lung cancer and, and breast cancer, a scan for cervical cancer, a pap smear. Um, for colon, for colon cancer, like we'll talk about, there are multiple um, screening tests that kind of run the gamut of invasiveness. Um, and I'll put in my plug for why I'm getting a colonoscopy at age 45, and I'm going to make my wife do it too. Um, so, just as kind of a, to point out, for all these different kind of cancers that we see in the you know in the GI tract, but also other types of cancer, the earlier stage cancers. Um, have very good survival rates. As cancers more progress, by the time you diagnose it, it becomes harder to cure and effectively treat it. This is a summary of the colon cancer guidelines um, by the US Preventive Services Task Force. There are multiple different guidelines that come out for cancer screening. This is the one that's kind of the considered the gold standard like that they test physicians on on our board exams, okay? Um, and they have different grades of evidence. The traditional was age 50 to 75. And recently they have expanded that, which you'll see in the second row to 40, age, ages 45 to 49. We are seeing an increased rate of colorectal cancers diagnosed in people at younger ages for whatever reason. Um, we've, as oncologists, we've all seen people way too young having advanced colon cancers. Um, and so I think 
it was, you know, the data came out that basically we need to move this up. Now, um, generally, once you get past age 75, you have to start thinking about that question of, okay, what, what is, how many other medical problems does this person have? Uh, do we expect that there to be any reason they're not going to live to age 95 or 100? Because the, these screening tests are basically meant to prevent problems years or decades down the road. And so, you know, it starts to be, you know, not to be crass, but as somebody gets older, um, it may not be a smart measure to put someone through a procedure for these things that aren't going to cause issues during their lifetime. Um, and, and an important thing to point out for, the, for this table is this is talking about the average risk person, no family history, no symptoms. Um, someone walks in off the street at age 45, I don't need to know anything else about them. I say, okay, you're 45, you need a colonoscopy. That's the bare minimum. So 45 is the oldest that it should be. There are people in higher risk situations that need to get a colonoscopy earlier. Um, like we talked about, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, they're going to have to get earlier colonoscopy. If you have a um, you know, personal history of other types of cancer, or certain family history or certain types of polyps on a prior colonoscopy, um, you need more intensive um, screening. If you've had prior radiation to the abdomen, that's a less common scenario that we run into, that's higher risk. It, the general rule that we use um, in terms of family history is we take the family member that had colon cancer and we say, what age were you when you were diagnosed? And we subtract 10 from that. So if your father or your brother or your sister was diagnosed with colon cancer at age 48, you should get a colonoscopy at age 38. Or, or if you have colon cancer at age 50, you have to tell your kids, hey, you should get your first colonoscopy 10 years before that at age 40. Um, and that's just kind of a general rule. I think, um, you know, talking to, if, if you feel like you're in a high risk population, you should be able to talk to your primary care doctor. There are guidelines that are available um, that basically provide what the um, best age and interval for, interval for colonoscopies is. Typically in an average risk individual with a normal colonoscopy, you don't need another colonoscopy for 10 years. But if you're higher risk, um, sometimes you may need it more frequently than that. These are the different types of screening tests that can be done uh, to diagnose colon cancer. And, and within the guidelines, the, the most frequent one you, ones you'll see are these um, stool tests where you actually take a sample and mail it. Um, and it's looking for FOBT sits for fecal occult blood or a FIT fecal immunochemical testing. And now are, there are these ones that have the DNA part of them called the Cologuard tests. You'll see it advertised. Um, quite a bit. And, you know, those have the advantage of not being a colonoscopy. They have the disadvantage that if these tests flag as abnormal, the next test you have to do is, you guess it, a colonoscopy. Um, and so the colonoscopy is kind of the gold standard. They, you know, these CTs um, are, I've definitely seen patients that have normal CT scans and they, and then you can't see what's on the inside of the of the colon, and so I think it's less accurate. The sigmoidoscopy doesn't get the scope all the way through the colon, so it kind of stops. It would catch colon cancer in the descending left side of the colon, but you wouldn't be able to see anything past there. So the full colonoscopy is going to be able to assess the whole colon. And the other advantage there, um, and the reason that this would be the gold standard in my opinion, is that you, if you do a colonoscopy and you see a polyp, while they're in there, they can remove it. So in other words, there are these precancerous polyps. We looked at that early slide of the cells getting mutations and developing to a polyp. Well, the, so the colonoscopy is not just finding cancer, it's also preventing cancer because you can go in there and remove the precancerous polyps before they become cancer. Um, and, and so that's my main reason why that's what I would do. Now, that being said, um, I have never done a colonoscopy prep myself. Um, so some of you probably have, and I know that it is not fun. And there are also some people that have, you know, no matter how much I describe this, they have a mental block, um, you know, the, the idea of the procedure, they will not do it. So um, for those folks, I say the best type of screening is some kind of screening. 
Okay. So I have definitely compromised and say, okay, listen, you're not ready to do the colonoscopy. Let's do um, the stool based test, the fit test. And when the fit test comes back, if, you know, God forbid, hopefully it comes back normal every year. But when it comes back abnormal, those patients that were against doing the colonoscopy before, nine times out of 10, when they're staring down the barrel of, um, you know, this potential, they, you know, they can summon up the, the nerves uh, to do it. Um, that being said, a- another problem with these stool-based tests is there are false positives because you're trying not to miss anything. So there are people that get a positive screen on this, get scared, go to the colonoscopy and there's no cancer. Great. Um, that's, that's a best case scenario. So um, kind of moving on to from the screening and prevention aspect to now, okay, we've diagnosed a new colon cancer. Typically this will have been done on a colonoscopy and they see a, um, a mass there or a polyp and either remove it or take a biopsy. And the pathologist looks at it under the slide and says, show, sees that there's invasive cancer in there. So they have a colon cancer. So typically the first steps when we have diagnosed a colon cancer are basically to do a scan of the rest of the body to make sure we don't see any evidence of cancer spreading anywhere else. Um, And usually that's gonna be a CT scan um, with IV contrast of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. The most common place that colon and rectal cancers like to go is the liver. So um, that's a organ that we look at especially closely. Usually we'll do basic blood work to see, does this person have anemia from having blood loss from this um, tumor? There's a tumor marker in the blood called the CEA um, that when that is elevated, that can give us some hint as to risk. But the main point of this tumor marker um, is to get it as a baseline so that after the surgery, you can see it come down, hopefully to, you know, to, to the normal range, and then you can follow it over the years. And if that marker is going up, you have to be concerned that there was some cancer hiding somewhere else in the body. That the CEA, you know, you might be thinking, well, there's a tumor marker in the blood. Why can't we use that as our screening instead of a colonoscopy? Well, the problem is um, it's not very sensitive and it's not very specific, meaning the CEA level can be elevated for reasons other than colon cancer. And I have seen people with widespread, you know, um, stage four colon cancer that their, their cancer doesn't produce this tumor marker. Their tumor marker is completely normal. So if that's all you used as your screening, you would miss um, cases. So um, let's say new colon cancer is diagnosed. We do our CT scan. There's no cancer elsewhere in the body. Give me one second. Sorry about that. Baby mama there, what's going on? Um, So there's no evidence of colon cancer being spread elsewhere in the body on the CT scan. And then in that case, Typically, the um, for colon cancer, I'm going to separate it out from colon and rectal cancer because they are treated differently. So up through the end of the colon, the first line treatment is essentially surgical resection. And typically, it's, um, you know, like a hemicolectomy, meaning you cut off one half of the colon. And ideally, you then sew together the remaining aspects. So in this case, for example, on the right side, the intestine was connecting here in through the cecum, that's the appendix there on that little tail. You cut off this area and then you attach the small intestines now halfway up um, to the colon. Or um, you, you know, if it's right here in the center, you might cut off from these two areas and sew the two pieces of colon together. Or in this case, um, you, you sew together this area of the colon into the rectum. And, and in these cases, um, you know, typically, unless there's some other complication or problem, um, patients are able to preserve their bowel function, meaning every, the plumbing inside should still work normally and you don't need a bag or anything like that. Um, and everything is just kind of sewed back up together. During the surgery, um, lymph nodes are removed from around those areas to look for any spread um, of the cancer. And if there is any cancer in the lymph nodes to remove it. And then after the surgery is basically when we get our information of the stage, which we talked about. So stage zero cancers are basically have not really invaded through the wall of the um, colon. And then within stage one, it's, it's 
basically T is, is a measurement of how far the tumor has invaded into the wall of the colon. N stage is, is whether there are lymph nodes involved and M means are there metastases out elsewhere in the body. Um, once you have any lymph nodes involved for colon cancer, it's automatically a stage three. And then, you know, these three A, three B, three C is related to how many lymph nodes have cancer in them. The um, stage ones have not invaded too far into the wall of the colon and there are no lymph nodes involved. The stage two cancers have been invaded further through the wall of the colon, but the lymph nodes are all, are all negative for cancer. And as you go up in stage, the risk that the cancer has already spread before the surgery and will eventually come back are unfortunately higher. You see the rates of survival at five years, you know, in this data set, 99%, the, you know, the cure rate's above 90% for stage zero to one. Cure rate is still above, um, in, in some respects, near 90% for the stage two cancers. As you get to stage three, our cure rate still good, but, you know, that's still, 25% or so of patients that are not cured. And then in stage four, um, there, there are certain cases that are curable, which is something unique to colon and rectal cancer, um, but the majority of cases are now incurable and our goal is to just control the disease as long as we can. So I think in, in stage two colon cancer, um, there are certain high risk features that tend to lead us towards treating it as more similar to a stage three than a stage one cancer. Um, one of those is a T4 tumor. So if it invades all the way through the colon wall um, into this adjacent tissues, we know that those cancers tend to be pretty similar in risk to the ones that have positive lymph nodes. Um, there are certain factors on the biopsy, you know, on, on the sample they get in the pathology lab, whether there's microscopic lymphovascular or perineural invasion, if there's a perforation, meaning if somebody comes in and gets their cancer diagnosed because their colon has ruptured or if their colon is completely obstructed, those patients have higher risk. Um, if, sorry, this is a misspelling, indeterminate margins, meaning if at the time of surgery, the pathologist isn't able to see that all of the cancer has been taken out, usually they'll look um, and basically say, okay, all of this is cancer and taken out. And we see on every single side, there's normal non-cancerous tissue that was taken out, they can feel more confident that you got all of it. And then if you don't get enough lymph nodes sampled, usually at least 12 lymph nodes have to be sampled. If you don't get more than 12 lymph nodes, you may wonder, were there, did you get enough of a sample to prove that none of the lymph nodes were involved? And in fact, if fewer lymph nodes are retrieved, you may be missing people that were stage three that you just didn't diagnose because you didn't get enough lymph nodes. And so those things, um, lead some, to someone having a little bit higher risk in the spectrum of stage two cancers. Um, the reason that's important, I guess, um, I didn't leave myself a slide to say this, but typically on a stage one cancer and at the very least an average risk stage two cancer, once you do the surgery, there is no benefit to further treatment. And we basically just go into surveillance where we do a colonoscopy a year after the surgery, do scans, CT scans every so often. And once five years have passed, we say, okay, in retrospect, five years ago at the time of your surgery, your cancer was cured. Um, in these high risk stage two patients, especially the ones that have you know, spread through the wall of the colon and all stage three colon cancers, you, we recommend um, what's called adjuvant chemotherapy. So what is adjuvant chemotherapy? So adjuvant means after a definitive surgery, chemotherapy is chemotherapy. Um, why do I have a picture of a dandelion in a lawn? Uh, th this is a basically a metaphor that um, people can feel free to tell me it's a bad metaphor, but I use it with my patients. I, I tend, it tends to be helpful, I think, for people to conceptualize this. So you can imagine um, this lawn of grass is like your normal cells in the body. And now you have this weed, this dandelion, um, which is your colon cancer tumor. And your the surgery is essentially digging this up by the root, making sure you got all the roots, taking this out. You see there's no dandelion there anymore, throwing it you know, into your neighbor's yard or into the trash or whatever. And you say, okay, great. I have no dandelion anymore. And, and, and we look and we see, yep, everything around there is normal grass. Now, um, and, and it may be that that's all that you needed to do. 
But the problem is these little seeds of the dandelion may have already spread elsewhere in your lawn, too small to detect. You wouldn't see it um, at all, but now next spring, what do you know? Now there's dandelions popping up everywhere on the lawn. And so the idea of the adjuvant chemotherapy is to say, okay, if there are these little seedlings of cancer that have escaped out these, you know, these few clusters of cells to other places in the body, the adjuvant chemotherapy is like saying, okay, let's take some weed killer and put it on a sprinkler system and just apply it to our whole lawn um, to try to kill off any seeds before they're able to take root. And that's important in cancer because when there are small clusters of cells that are too small to detect, you have more of a chance to be able to eradicate them. If, if the cancer is able to take hold and be in multiple places in the body um, and big enough to detect, at that point, um, the treatments aren't able to, at least the treatments we have now, aren't able to eradicate them forever. And so even though you know these weed killers you can imagine on a lawn can cause damage initially to the grass. Similarly, our chemotherapy has side effects and toxicities to the rest of the body. Um, but we find that we are able to, in stage three cancer, for example, um, in stage three cancer, it can be as much as one in five extra people, somewhere on the order of one in five to one in eight people that are converted to being cured. Um, compared to if you didn't get the chemotherapy. And we know that because of trials where they took people that had their surgery and half of them, they randomized, let's do chemotherapy. Half of them um, randomized to a placebo, essentially a sham chemotherapy and follow how, you know, what happens. And, and since then we've iterated on that to find what are the effective chemotherapy regimens. In general, um, for adjuvant chemotherapy and colon cancer, the, the two main um, staple regimens you see are um, what's called Folfox or Capox. Um, generally, these chemotherapies are unsafe to put through a peripheral IV in the arm uh, because if that IV blows, then you have chemotherapy extravasating into your skin. It's not safe. And so we have people get a port. Um, under the skin that connects to one of the big veins, central vein, then that port gets accessed essentially with a needle to provide the chemotherapy that way. Um, the traditional full fox was really the most common one um, that was seen in, until maybe the last couple of years where more people have uh, moved over to this K-box, which I'll explain. The, the five fluorouracil, um, a lot of people that have had it or know someone who's had it will remember it by the fact that it's actually a bag that you wear or hold with you for 48 hours and it's continuously infusing um, over that time and then the pump is disconnected. And that for, by providing it over 48 hours that reduces the toxicity level and side effects. Um, capecitabine is actually a pill version that basically um, is metabolized in the body to act the same way as 5 fluorouracil so they have the same mechanism to fight cancer. Um, when capecitabine is used, the dosing is a little bit different. You usually take it twice a day for 14 days and then seven days off. The, um, so the Capox is generally in a 21 day cycle. The Fulfox is a 14 day cycle. Um, both of these typically in somebody that is fit and healthy enough are combined with oxaliplatin, um, which is only through the IV. And oxaliplatin has a major side effect of causing neuropathy that has to be watched, like numbness and tingling. Um, and so these are kind of the mainstay regimens. In, in, and, and really, the 5 fluorouracil and capecitabine parts of it are probably responsible for 80% of the effectiveness. So in somebody that I'm really worried about whether they're healthy enough to undergo chemotherapy without causing toxicity problems or side effects um, you know, that are very severe, I might just use maybe capecitabine um, and avoid the combination. But we know the combination is more effective. So um, generally in patients, um, in most patients, I'll try to give both. Now, um, this was a recent trial in 2020 called the IDEA trial that really changed the landscape of chemotherapy. So it's only a couple years old. Somebody who had colon cancer prior to 2020 was probably recommended to get six months of chemotherapy. And it's an every two week cycle for Folfox. So, you, for most, so most of them got 12 chemotherapy sessions. 
this study showed actually, um, at least for KPOX to a lesser degree Folfox, which is why I've moved more to KPOX, the th if you do three months of the KPOX, it seems to be equivalent to six months of the full Fox or KPOX. And so we've been able to move most patients to going to three months of chemotherapy, which has been a game changer because it's three months less of feeling really sick from chemotherapy, um, less risk of the neuropathy from oxaliplatin. Um, and there are certain high risk patients or, or certain reasons you might tend to go for six months anyway. Sorry, cat um, decided to join us somehow from my locked door. Um, so three months has become kind of more standard um, for these colon cancers. So rectal cancer, most of this is pretty similar. Um, the one main thing for rectal cancer is that MRI of the pelvis or, and or endoscopic ultrasound. Um, this is kind of a picture of what an ultrasound would look like are very important to kind of do the local staging before you do a surgery. So in colon cancer, if it hasn't spread elsewhere in the body, surgery is the upfront option. In rectal cancer, it, once you get to kind of stage two um, or above, actually it's been shown that more effective treatment is to do chemotherapy plus radiation and, and potentially extra chemotherapy before going to a surgery. Um, and this also same blood work, CT scan of the chest and abdomen to look at the liver and lungs but it has this extra step of kind of an MRI. Um, and for these rectal cancers, once you get to T3 or T4, extending further into the wall or have, pop, or have lymph nodes that are visible on the MRI, um, kind of the, the emerging standard of care, um, these are a couple of trials looking at it. Um, it it's been kind of evolving over the last decade. Um, we've known that chemotherapy plus radiation and chemotherapy and surgery are useful, but there were different sequences that people would do. Some people would do the radiation first, then surgery, then extra chemo. Um, and, and what's basically emerging is that um, it seems to be a more effective strategy to do the chemotherapy and radiation and some additional chemotherapy, then do the surgery. Um, and, and the outcomes seem to be better that way. Um, and this is essentially looking at, for one of these trials, I believe the RAPIDO trial, which was showing, okay, let's do the chemo and radiation, then the chemo, then the surgery versus chemo, radiation, then surgery, then chemo. Um, you know, the rate was about, what, six or 7% less of having a metastasis um, in the group that got all of the treatment before surgery. So, you know, uh, for every, that means for every 13 or 14 patients, you're curing an additional patient. So um, for most patients, I have moved over to giving all of the treatment before surgery. Now, um, there is, you know, surgery for rectal cancer can be a little bit more of a tough question than for the colon. Depending on where the tumor lies in the rectum, you can imagine that it's getting close to where your sphincter is that controls your poop. And so, you know, in order to adequately take out the tumor, some of these require surgery where they can't just sew it back together and, and, and you lose your anal function and have to live with a colostomy bag um, to empty your stool for the rest of your life. So that's a major, um, obviously a major life change, especially for young patients. Um, and there is, essentially this is, is basically showing you anatomically um, the difference between a low anterior resection, in this case, on this picture, they're able to take out these two areas and sew it back together. Whereas when it's kind of sitting lower, closer um, to the anal sphincter, you can't cut out that tumor and still reconnect it and have everything work. So you just have to kind of take this all out and put the colon in up through the skin and attach a bag. Um, to a stoma. And so in patients that need this type of resection, that um, is a serious question for them. There are studies ongoing. I think it's for sure true that some patients that get chemotherapy, you know, that total neoadjuvant therapy, meaning they get chemotherapy and radiation, then chemotherapy, um, some of them, their cancer is not visible at the time of surgery. And some of them seem to be cured. Um, and and the surgery may for some people actually turn out to be redundant. And so there are studies ongoing that say, okay, what if 
after we do chemotherapy and radiation and chemotherapy, if we can't see any tumor there anymore on all of our scans and all of our colonoscopies, why don't we just watch and wait really closely and only do the surgery in the people that show evidence of their tumor coming back? Well, we don't have the results of those studies yet. Um, in five years or 10 years, we may be changing our recommendations. As it stands now, the, the standard of care is even if you don't see any tumor, um, do the surgery because what you're risking if you don't do the surgery is maybe there's tumor left behind. And by the time you find it coming back, it, you've now given it risk that it's gonna spread elsewhere. And so the most aggressive approach is to say in every patient, do the surgery. There are some thoughts in people that are more frail, harder to tolerate a surgery, um, or if you're talking about it's going to be a colostomy bag, it can be a discussion of whether to do kind of an enhanced surveillance. If you do the, all the chemotherapy and all the chemotherapy and you still have some tumor left over, then it's no question you have to do the surgery. Um, but there are some patients that get such a good response that their cancer never seems to come back. Um, now, in terms of talking about stage four um, cancer, which unfortunately, as a medical oncologist that manages chemotherapy and those types of treatments, um, this is a reasonable number of patients that I um, see. And um, there's, in colon and rectal cancer, as I kind of shortly referenced before, there are some patients that have stage four disease, what's called, what's called oligometastatic, meaning they only have like one or two spots of cancer visible. Um, and some of these patients, it turns out, if you resect those metastases with surgery, um, they may be cured. It's not, you know, the odds are against that. These are graphs looking at if you have one or two liver metastases and you resect them and do surgery, um, you know, 30%, 20 to 30% of patients are alive with no recurrence of their cancer five, 10 years down the line. So um, in most cancer types, once it's spread elsewhere, even if it's one spot, we generally say it's the cat's out of the bag. We can't surgically remove it because it's inevitably in other spots. Um, for some reason, colon cancer sometimes just seeds one or two areas. And although sometimes their cancer then spreads elsewhere, um, they can potentially be cured. So that um, is an important thing. In these widely spread cancers that are, you know, in multiple different spots already, at that point, you can't surgically resect all of them. Even if you did, the cancer would pop up elsewhere. It wouldn't improve your outcomes. Um, and so in those patients that unfortunately are stage four, we can't surgically resect um, their tumor, or we can't give them chemotherapy to shrink it down to the point that we can resect um, their metastatic disease, then the treatment is basically aimed at keeping the cancer under control, shrinking it, um, trying to reduce side effects of the cancer, trying to keep it at bay to extend somebody's life as much as possible, but not be able to cure it traditionally, okay? And um, the, there are different treatment strategies for that. The mainstay of treatment is traditional chemotherapy. So just the same drugs that we use um, for the adjuvant chemotherapy after surgery in the higher risk patients, bifluorouracil, capcitabine, oxaliplatin. Um, when patients progress on those, if, if their cancer becomes resistant to those treatments, there are other types of chemotherapy, irinotecan. Um, this one's a mouthful. Um, I think the brand name is Lonser for that one. And I guess there are marketers that determined, well, that's a little bit easier to pronounce than trifluoridine to Pareso. Um, these chemotherapy generally works um, to disrupt um, division of cells. And so um, it's trying to disrupt copying of DNA um, or other mechanisms to basically disrupt an ability for a cell to divide. That's important because cancer cells divide and spread by their nature faster than the rest of the cells in the body. But these chemotherapies are not targeted. So in other words, they're disrupting the cell division everywhere in the body. It's a, the way I describe it to people is this is a poison that's going through your body. It's designed to be a more effective poison against cancer cells than normal cells, but it's still a poison. And so, um, you know, there are definitely the side effects of energy level going down, um, nausea, we use medicines to try to control that, um, which have come a long way in the last 10 years, um, lower appetite, changes in taste, 
all of these things that um, people who've had friends or family that have gone through chemo or who have gone through chemo themselves um, know about. And um, trying, you know, we're trying with these treatments to do more damage to the cancer than we're doing to the rest of the body, but it can be a, a fine line. And at any point, if the cancer is resistant to these treatments, or if we're doing too much damage to the rest of the body, um, then we have to stop them or change strategies, okay? Um, other things that can be used, um, these anti-angiogenic agents. So these are, you know, bevacizumab is the one I use most often. There are other medications kind of in this field. They are basically used to disrupt this receptor called VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, um, which, which provides a signal to cells to create blood supply. So cells that are growing and dividing, they need oxygen to grow and divide, they need blood supply. So with these medicines, you're trying to disrupt the cancer's ability to feed itself with blood supply, to cut it off from being able to grow. So bevacizumab is often used in combination with chemotherapy. Um, there are these tyrosine kinase inhibitors, so EGFR inhibitors, and now more so BRAF inhibitors. Um, can sometimes be used. They tend to be, as we'll talk about in a bit, they're more effective in left-sided colon cancers, the EGFR inhibitors. Um, in certain colon cancers that have a mutation in the KRAS, NRAS, or BRAF, these medicines aren't effective typically um, because the, the EGFR pathway block the signaling at this pathway, but if it's mutated down here, um, this inhibitor doesn't stop the signaling down here. So um, it, it's kind of in, in patients that have a mutation in BRAF, you can sometimes, there are new BRAF inhibitors and you can, buy, can combine the BRAF inhibitor with an EGFR inhibitor um, to try to overcome this. But these are kind of more targeted treatments, still have side effects, but um, are more, a little bit more targeted than traditional chemotherapy. Um, this is kind of looking at that right-sided versus left-sided colon cancer. This is a major um, area of research. It turns out that in um, fetal development, when a baby is being developed, the development of the right side of the colon is actually separate from the left side. It's in, in the mid-gut versus the hindgut, and the blood supplies are different um, to these areas of the colon. And in fact, um, there, there, there seem to be signal differences in the genetics of those cancers. And it turns out the right-sided cancers tend to be a little bit worse prognosis, um, uh, tend to have a little bit worse outcomes, tend to have more of these KRAS and BRAF mutations than the left side. Um, and so there's more research ongoing to say, how do we more effectively target these right-sided tumors? Um, and what are the differences really between these, um, even though it's all the colon? Oh, I'm accidentally drawing. Um, another big area of research and things that probably people have heard about with multiple different types of cancer immunotherapy. Um, you'll see commercials all the time for Keytruda, which is pembrolizumab. Um, there's also a, a competing combination, nivolumab and ipilimumab. So in the gastrointestinal cancers, including colon cancers, these immunotherapies haven't been as much of a breakthrough as in certain other types of cancer, but um, in, a, in a decent percentage of colon cancers, if about 10, 15%, if they have this marker for microsatellite instability or deficient mismatch repair, those patients very much benefit from the immunotherapy. The majority of colon cancers, unfortunately, don't have either of those markers, and the immunotherapy has been proven ineffective. The way that these immunotherapy drugs work is essentially the first line of defense against a cancer is your own body's immune system. Cancer cells, as part of their mutations, develop a camouflage um, that stops your own immune system from being able to recognize the cancer. These immunotherapy drugs attempt, uh, essentially attempt to strip away the camouflage so that the cancer is, um, is able to be identified by your own body's immune system and have the immune system attack it and kill it. Sometimes in terms of side effects, the immune system activation accidentally gets targeted against normal parts of the body and, and it can be um, kind of unpredictable. But in general, the average patient I have that's on the immunotherapies has no side effects at all, to be honest. 
Um, sometimes there can be severe side effects it, and, and it's really less predictable than chemotherapy, but much better tolerated than chemotherapy. And the major trial that came out recently was looking at, okay, if, if we have patients with these tumors that have the mismatch repair or microsatellite instability, if we start off with immunotherapy versus, which is in the green versus chemotherapy, how are people gonna do over time? And we can see unprecedented response rates. Um, you know, these are stage four cancers and going out to four years, um, th this is the progression period for survival. So essentially 40 to 50% of patients, four years down the line, their cancer has not progressed while they're on the immunotherapy. And, and this is, kind of a big difference compared to traditional chemotherapy where it works for a while, but then the cancer tends to become resistant more quickly. Um, and, and we're seeing, you know, um, this, this is a major breakthrough, but we need more breakthroughs for the majority of patients that don't have these markers. We need to understand why does immunotherapy work in, in one subset of patients and not in another subset? What can we do to overcome um, a cancer is resistant to this type of treatment or develop new types of treatment. Um, there are other targeted agents that can sometimes be used. There's new um, methods called next generation sequencing to basically sequence the entire genome of the cancer cells to look for targetable mutations on the surface of it. These are uncommon um, in colon cancer. A few percent of patients will have a HER2 marker um, the HER2 marker is most commonly associated with breast cancer. You'll see that used a lot, but we have targeted antibodies um, and even these new antibody directed chemo drugs that can basically find the HER2 marker on the cell, target the treatment only to those cells that have the HER2 marker. And, that, and the big advantage over these targeted treatments, if you can use them, is that instead of it being a poison to all the cells in the body, you're only targeting those cells that have these marker on it, which the, you know, for the most part should be cancer cells. And so it really reduces the side effect profile of these medicines and allows us to use them longer um, and cause less impact on someone's life. Because another major thing is keeping quality of life as good as possible um, while also going through these treatments, okay? Um, similarly, the NTREC mutation has these pills, um, entrectinib, larotrectinib, and there's more research ongoing to try to find these targets or find ways um, to do new treatments for colon cancer. We need more of it. So in summary, um, that was, sorry, long-winded um, and probably overly complicated presentation. The summary that I would say is colorectal cancer is one of the more common types of cancer in the United States. We're getting more and more diagnoses of people at younger ages. Please start screening at age 45. Tell your family members to start aging, start screening at age 45, potentially younger if you have other risk factors. But any person, like I said, any person off the street, you tell me you're age 45, I'm ordering you a colonoscopy. Um, and if you don't want to do a colonoscopy, there are other options for, treat, for, for screening that are less invasive. At least do that. Um, when colorectal cancer is caught early, it is most often curable the majority of the time. Even stage three patients that have it in their lymph nodes, um, the cure rates are approaching you know, 70, 80%. Once cancer has spread elsewhere in the body, if it's caught too late, it can be either extremely rarely curable or not curable. Um, and so we need to catch these earlier to allow us to cure them. Um, and you know, even in the worst case scenario, we have multiple types of effective treatment more research is always ongoing to optimize the current treatments we already have available and to find new avenues for new types of treatment. And so with that, um, I guess I can open up um, the floor to any questions or comments um, that anyone might have.